Welcome back, everyone, to another installment of Space This Week, your Monday rundown of all things Starship development news, launch events from the past week, and all the other stories I think are interesting to discuss. It has been one crazy week for Space News, guys. We've had a lot of explosive developments with Starship, big news for Hubble and Crew Dragon, Firefly Aerospace successfully reached orbit, NASA's DART mission impacted successfully, BE4 engine updates from Tori Bruno, NASA retired the Sophia mission, and much, 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 much more. Let's get right into things, beginning, as usual, with Starship updates. We begin with big plumes visible in this shot of Lab Padre's Sapphire Cam. This was the result of an apparent test to destruction of the E-Dome Starship prototype. This was rolled out quite a while ago, but we hadn't seen any action from it until now. The E-Dome test tank uses a new elliptically shaped bulkhead dome design, which is flatter than the design that SpaceX have been using so far, which is advantageous because it takes up less volume overall, allowing more space in the rocket to be dedicated to fuel and payload. This destructive test was clearly designed to push the design to its limits and see if it could stand up to the tolerances that SpaceX require. It'll probably be a while until we find out if it met SpaceX's targets, unless we are graced with an Elon tweet addressing the test directly at some point in the next few days. Speaking of destructive stuff, it looks like Ship 26 will be sporting a new design for its flight termination system enclosure. On previous ships, crews have had to unbolt metal plates from the FTS aero covers to gain access to the system. But on Ship 26's common dome, the FTS boxes appear to have hinged doors, allowing easier access to the system's guts. More explosion stuff now! Kinda. <laughs> Workers have been swarming the orbital launch mount essentially around the clock for the past week. The reason for all of this work appears to be in support of installing more blast shielding to protect the structure, one of many ongoing projects that SpaceX is undertaking to protect various systems in the event of an explosion, which almost certainly stems from the spin prime test explosion that Booster 7 suffered a couple of months ago. Ryan Hansen created this animation of the metal plates being added to the hold down arms, which will prevent any explosive force and heat from entering the table around the sides of the hold down arms. The ongoing installation of all of these upgrades are the reason that Booster 8 hasn't been mounted into the launch table yet. As for Booster 7, it remains in the Mega Bay, undergoing its final upgrades before its 33 engine static fire test and eventual orbital launch attempt. It's being supported by both bridge cranes to allow workers to access the engines more easily and to allow easier access for the installation of its center engine, which was removed following its 7 engine static fire test. Booster 9 is also coming along well. Its aft section was moved to the Mega Bay on Tuesday. The aft section is, of course, the bit that the engines attach to, and it's believed that Booster 9 will be the first booster to use the new Raptor 2.1 engines. Raptor 2.1 isn't as big of a jump as we saw going from Raptor 1 to Raptor 2, but these engines are still an upgrade. They will use electric thrust control instead of hydraulic thrust control. Reddit user Duffman of the Cosmos was in the right place at the right time on Friday. They captured this photo of what appears to be a new Starship Tower segment on the road in Houston, Texas. Now, while Boca Chica is located in Texas, this segment is almost guaranteed to be heading up to Florida for SpaceX's Starbase Kennedy. There's a chance that this could be for either the new Starship Launch Tower or possibly for the new Falcon 9 Crew Dragon Tower for Space Launch Complex 40. Or it could be for both. There's a chance that the tower could serve both Starship and Falcon at Launch Complex 40, possibly with the Falcon pad on one side and the Starship pad on the other. What do you think? Will SpaceX be able to make a dual-use Falcon and Starship tower, or will we get a copy of what we see at Pad 39A, a separate pad and tower for Starship and Falcon? Let me know what you think in the comments down below. And hey, while you're down there, if you are enjoying the video, then don't forget to leave a like and subscribe so that you never miss a Monday Space News update. It really helps support what I do here, and I always do appreciate it. NASA made a big announcement last week, stating that they were working with SpaceX to investigate the feasibility of using the Crew Dragon spacecraft to conduct servicing and altitude-boosting missions to the aging Hubble Space Telescope to help extend the telescope's life. Polaris operator Jared Isaacman is involved as well, and he'll be financing the Polaris Dawn mission, which is scheduled to launch no earlier than March 2023, and this mission will involve the first ever commercial extravehicular activity with SpaceX-designed EVA spacesuits, which would be a valuable capability for a potential Hubble servicing mission. NASA and SpaceX will spend the next six months studying the possibility of a Dragon Hubble mission, with the primary focus being on the feasibility of a reboost mission, either piloted or uncrewed. In the past, Hubble servicing missions were conducted by the Space Shuttle, which, unlike Dragon, had an 18-meter cargo bay and a 15-meter robot arm. 
However, during the shuttle's final Hubble servicing mission, a grapple fixture was added to the telescope, so SpaceX engineers may be able to design a mechanism that will allow Dragon to dock with Hubble. This is a really exciting project, and I'm happy to see that we may get a few more years out of the Hubble Space Telescope. We had a super exciting flight on Saturday. This was Firefly Aerospace's To The Black mission, which was their second ever orbital launch attempt of their Firefly Alpha rocket, which sadly encountered a launch failure on its maiden flight back in September last year, after one of the first stage engines failed approximately 15 seconds after launch. This time around, the rocket was loaded up with a bunch of education and technology demonstration payloads. In total, there were two CubeSats and five PicoSats, several of which were cloned replacement of the payloads that were lost during the first launch attempt. Anyway, with all that said and done, I am pleased to say that the flight this time around was a success. The live stream was hosted by Everyday Astronaut, and while it was unfortunately quite foggy, tracking cameras were able to capture some great footage of the flight, including the moment of main engine cutoff and second stage ignition, in which you can actually see the rocket engine's exhaust push the lower stage away as it throttles up. You can also see the two fairing halves falling away from the second stage a little bit later on. The success of Firefly Alpha is a significant achievement for Firefly Aerospace. The Alpha is certainly a very ambitious first rocket. With a payload capacity of just under 1.2 metric tons to low Earth orbit, the Alpha is one of the largest small lift launch vehicles out there, measuring in at nearly twice the height of Rocket Lab's Electron. And like Electron, the Alpha is made entirely from carbon fiber composite. And it's also matched the Electron's achievement of managing to reach orbit on only its second ever launch attempt, something that the vast majority of new rockets don't achieve. SpaceX, for example, needed four tries to get their Falcon 1 into orbit. Huge congratulations to the team on this launch. I can't wait for the next one, which so far is slated for next month, the 29th of November, where the rocket will launch NASA's Venture Class Launch Services Mission 2, which will carry a number of CubeSats to orbit. We saw two launches from China on the 26th of September. The first was a Long March 2D, which launched three Yaogan satellites to low Earth orbit. Yaogan satellites are largely known to primarily support the People's Liberation Army Strategic Support Force and serve as military reconnaissance satellites. They contain various means of remote sensing, including optical reconnaissance, synthetic aperture radar, and electronic intelligence for maritime surveillance. The second Chinese launch was a Long March 6, which launched three Cheyenne satellites. According to official sources, the satellites have entered their planned orbit successfully and will provide data for land survey, urban planning, and disaster prevention. However, several sources report that there are some strong similarities between these satellites and the Yaogan series of satellites, which of course are predominantly used for military, optical, and radar reconnaissance. We have some space station news now from both the Tiangong and International Space Station. On the ISS, European Space Agency astronaut Samantha Cristoforetti became the new commander of the space station on the 28th of September. She will lead the new Expedition 68 crew until she and three of her SpaceX Dragon crewmates depart the space station in October. The next day, Roscosmos cosmonauts Oleg Artemyev, Denis Matviev, and Sergei Korsakov departed the station aboard their Soyuz MS-21 spacecraft, which successfully undocked from the pre-chow module before deorbiting, re-entering the atmosphere, and successfully landing in Kazakhstan. This Soyuz MS-21 spacecraft was named SP Korolev to honor Sergei Pavlovich Korolev, Soviet rocket scientist regarded by many as the father of practical astronautics, who directed the Soviet space program during the space race, overseeing the Sputnik and Vostok projects, which included many notable achievements, including the first human-to-Earth orbit mission by Yuri Gagarin. Over on the Chinese space station now, on the 30th of September, the recently added Wentian laboratory module was successfully transferred from the front docking port of the Tianhe core module over to the module's starboard docking port. This was done with the space station's indexing robot arm, and the purpose behind the move was to make way for the upcoming Mengtian module, which is scheduled to launch later this month. This will be the third module for the station, and the second laboratory module. After 10 months in space, NASA's double asteroid redirection test, better known as the DART mission, successfully impacted its asteroid target last Monday, smashing into the asteroid Dimorphos. This was the world's first ever planetary defense technology demonstration mission, and the objective here was to see if crashing a spacecraft into an asteroid would be a viable way to redirect its course in the event of an asteroid or comet on a collision course with Earth were to ever be discovered. To be clear, asteroid Dimorphos was not on a collision course with Earth, so there's no need to panic. The DART teams will now observe Dimorphos using ground-based telescopes to confirm 
confirmed that the DART's impact altered its trajectory around Didymos, the large asteroid that Dimorphos orbits. Incredibly, we have some third-person views of the DART impact. That's because 15 days before impact, the DART released the Licia Cube satellite, provided by the Italian Space Agency, which captured images of the impact and the resulting cloud of ejected matter expelled from the asteroid. Hopefully, we will never need to use the capabilities proven by the DART mission, but it's reassuring that humanity is now one step more prepared in the event of a world-ending asteroid discovery. United Launch Alliance boss Tori Bruno has teased us all with more BE-4 engine test footage. This video contains just over four minutes of more than half a million pounds of thrust spewing forth, and according to Tori on Twitter, this engine exceeded all of his expectations in performance and hopes that United Launch Alliance's Vulcan, which of course is powered by the BE-4, will be ready to launch very soon. Here's hoping that that's true. The Vulcan will be a beast of a machine, and I can't wait to see it fly. It is a shame that it's replacing the Delta IV Heavy, though. No matter how great Vulcan may be, there's just something so cool about the Delta IV Heavy. And since the BE-4 is powered by methane, the Vulcan won't set itself on fire like the hydrogen-powered Delta IV Heavy does. I think that United Launch Alliance has really missed a trick there. <laughs> now, speaking of big orange rockets, the SLS was rolled back from the launch pad into the safety of the Vehicle Assembly Building last week due to the looming danger of Hurricane Ian, which has ripped its way onto the Florida coast. Greg Scott was on the ground this time and caught some shots of the action. The 10-hour crawl back to the building went smoothly, and not only does this mean that the rocket is now protected, but this also gives the teams an opportunity to address the flight termination system batteries, which are only rated for so many days, and return the rocket back to flight-ready status. Kyle Montgomery captured a nice video time-lapse of the vehicle entering the building as well. We got some new footage from the Ukrainian airfield that was home to the AN-225, the world's largest airplane that was sadly destroyed during Russia's invasion. We've only really had a few scraps of footage here and there, but last week this footage was released to the internet showing the true extent of the destruction. I know this is not really strictly space news related, but I know that many of you would have been fans of this amazing machine, and it's a sad sight to see it destroyed. Last week, NASA announced the retirement of the world's largest flying observatory. The Stratospheric Observatory for Infrared Astronomy, or just SOFIA, was a Boeing 747 jetliner modified to carry a roughly 17 metric ton, 2.5 meter telescope. The plane had a garage door-like mechanism that rolled up to allow the telescope to observe the skies during flight, which itself was one of the largest open ports ever flown on an aircraft. Over its life, SOFIA has helped astronomers around the world use infrared light to study an impressive array of cosmic events and objects invisible to other telescopes. One of SOFIA's more notable discoveries was water on the sunlit surface of the moon, meaning that water may be distributed across the entire lunar surface, not just limited to cold, shadowed places. Check out this three-dimensional view of the Orion Nebula, Earth's closest star-forming nursery. This model was created using data from SOFIA, and it shows us the structure of the nebula in great detail, and it also shows a bubble that has been blown clear of gas and dust by a powerful stellar wind. In this way, massive stars can regulate star formation around them, and SOFIA has helped astronomers better understand this effect. Lan Aerospace had a quiet one this weekend because I was off mountain biking in Wales all weekend, so I wasn't really about to fly any rockets. <laughs> I made a video on my second channel if that sounds like it might be something you'd enjoy, but for now, I'll leave you with this list of names on screen. They're my Patreon and YouTube members, whose financial support of my channel enables me to carry on making these videos for you every single Monday. If you want to join their ranks, then you can do so by following the link in the description or via the card on screen, and check out that biking video link on screen as well. If it sounds good to you, you get to watch me fall off a bike, so watch not to love about that. <laughs> anyway guys, that's all from me. I'll see you all next time, which will actually I think be on Wednesday. I've got some Planet Coaster content that I think is going to be ready for Wednesday, so